Hey everybody, welcome to Real Estate Success with Jim Ingersoll. I am super excited that you're along today because we're gonna show you exactly step-by-step step, how to build a volume wholesaling business because my guest Dan Breslin has done so in five different cities around the United States and he's got tremendous deal flow in Chicago, Atlanta, Miami, Tampa, and Philly. And uh, he's got great deal flow and he's getting stuff closed. They do some rehabbing, uh, but they do a lot of wholesaling. And that's gonna be our topic today is we're gonna talk to you about how to build a wholesaling business because what I see is a lot of real estate investors, they sort of get started, they sort of struggle, then they get a deal under their belt and they can't really scale up. And they can't really go from like taking this real estate gig as a hobby up to a legitimate volume business. And Dan has done that. So I want to dig into how he has done that. So Dan, welcome to Real Estate Success. Thanks, Jim. It's good to be here. So you're in Chicago now? I am in Chicago. If I look out the window that way, I see nothing but water and downtown city. So we're like, it's, it's almost like living on the beach. There's beaches out the window here. Awesome. Um, but yeah, Chicago is great for that. So that's like your headquarters? Uh, we have, yeah, we have offices here. I work mostly from home. Um, each of the teams works in each of the cities. We have offices located there also. Awesome. So let's, let's talk about um, how you got started. You've been doing this uh, since like 2006, right? Yes, sir. Same as me. I think I was maybe 2005. So about the same. We have a lot of things in common. And um, talk, take me back to like those early 2000 years. And how did you end up going into real estate in the beginning? I mean, I had like nothing else working out in my uh, life at the time, which I think a lot of people are usually down on their luck, yep. um, laid off of jobs and things of that nature when they discover real estate or finally go to pursue the dream of real estate. Um, and I didn't have a car. I had to get a ride by my dad to my first networking event. It was, uh, you know, needless to say, I was like down and out, 26 years old. The market was at the height uh, in 2006 in Philadelphia where I started. And uh, I just, uh, you know, took one of the get rich in real estate type seminars. My dad put the credit card up and, you know, off we went on that journey. Maybe six months later, did a deal, made my first $6,000 and figured out it was possible. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of kept it moving there. But I also crashed with the market and my skill set wasn't where it needed to be. Um, and so I, you know, rebuilt and developed that, you know, post 2012 ish personally. So you came back after the crash and came back with a fury. You were ready. Oh, weren't yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's fast forward to 2012. You're ready to come back in. You, you, I went through that whole cycle and it was rough, man. It really was. And I survived. Not many people did. Um, but <clears throat> let's go to like 2012. How did you, get your first deals restarted in 2012 and then start to build some momentum so you could feel confident that this is going to go into a legit business. <clears throat> I mean, I guess I really didn't know if it was going to come into a legit business. It was just the only thing Never that did. ever. That's a great takeaway for all of my listeners because you don't really know. And if somebody tells you they're hundred percent, this is it, then they're probably not telling you the truth. I, uh, I mean, nothing else had really worked for me. So that was what worked at all ever in my life. So it was like, I kept trying even through those lean years, I was still making money and making deals, but it was, uh, you know, it was really hit or miss for me. And it was before, like I said, started building the systems that turn it into a business, something that's sustainable. Um, so, you know, I guess it was just that detraction started to come back in 2012 people who I had, who I had known and network and borrowed money from, in you know 2007 2008 we're starting to finally feel like it was time to get off the bench so some of my partners kind of came back into the the foreground there and we started doing business together and it's been it's been really good since then so 2012 um talk about like how did you did you did you identify wholesaling so that you'd have active income and then like, did you start to build your buyers list first start to fill up your deal flow funnel how did you begin uh, it was definitely as always. And I tell the people that I ever meet who are trying to get in real estate, who don't have access to a ton of capital or other resources to bring to the table. Wholesaling is a great apprenticeship. And it was for me because of the fact that it taught me how to analyze deals, figure out deals, find deals that were deals and actually went to settlement when I found other people willing to pay me to step into my shoes. 
And on the flip side, it showed me when deals weren't deals and I had to cancel a contract and call the seller and tell them we weren't going to settlement because basically I screwed up the numbers or maybe there's too much debt or whatever the case was. Um, so it was not really a decision that, oh, wholesale is the great panacea of real estate. It was more like, you know, because I didn't have a ton of capital available and, uh, you know, the, the deals came through the pipeline that I started to build. It was logical to wholesale them out until I got to a place where partners were willing to put money on the table, go in on the deals 50-50, uh, a lot of that kind of stuff early on in 2012 to get back on the saddle to a place where we were. You know, and I think wholesaling is a great place to start. That's how I, that's what enabled me to leave corporate America, Dan. It really was. I started doing it part time and I struggled like everybody else. Like I would find a deal and not have a buyer. I'd have a buyer, not a deal. And then I was afraid of contracts, and, but then everything just started to click. And uh, I think my next year I did 120 wholesale deals. It all nice. just went boom, you know what I mean? But I, I was on like a treadmill before that, and I just felt like I was spinning my wheels. And, um, you know, I could have easily given up and missed all these years of investing, but I didn't. And um, so I think you're right. Wholesaling is a great apprenticeship because you learn what a motivated seller is. You learn about contracts. You learn about what people want to buy. So I think that's a great point to make about the apprenticeship. Um, so if you were if you were brand new and you weren't doing this uh, in all this volume with two to three hundred deals this year, what uh, what advice would you give yourself for restarting if you were going to start in 2018 instead of 2012? Um, 2018, it would still be the same thing to figure out how to leverage up in direct mail quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was always scared of large marketing budgets early on. A lot of the growth came from putting you know 75 percent of my gross income back into marketing. And a lot of that went to waste to figure out how to be more successful, you know, marketer, whether that's direct mail, whether that's, you know, hosting my podcast and presenting information to my audience, whether that is, um, you know, marketing to private lenders, investors, et cetera, to raise capital. Um, you know, in every aspect, it costs money to learn how to figure out how to do that better. And, and it would be nice to have figured that out a little earlier, but direct mail was definitely like one of the keys. Once you've been able to start to figure out how that works and get results that you can leverage up and scale your business to the next level. You know, wholesaling is a marketing business. It really is. It is core in my opinion. And so I'm glad you brought that up because you've got to be able to cast a wide net and connect with motivated sellers. And you mentioned direct mail. Um, talk to me a little bit about your marketing budget and, and sort of how you do some of that. Um, we will run right now like seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars per month. Uh, mm -hmm. We might send one hundred to two hundred thousand pieces of mail throughout those various markets: postcards, letters, you know, three or four touches to each address that comes up on the list. I prefer properties, Jim, that have equity in them. People yep. say like, "Oh yeah, what's the list? The list?" And they're looking for like the silver bullet answer. Oh yeah, mail to absentee sellers. Well, yeah, that's great. It works. Um, there's no real like giant cryptic way to go about it more so showing up consistently and being able to go forward to send out say 20,000 letters to absentee on our list and then follow that up with another 20,000 behind that another 20,000 behind that and that's going to take a few years for most people to grow to that point if somebody you know inherits a hundred grand from you know their grandmother that just passed and they're getting into real estate don't go by 20,000 letters on the heels of each consistent consecutive month because you heard Dan Breslin say that on Jim's um, podcast. You definitely have to figure out how to convert the leads. You got to figure out how to generate the leads It take the incoming calls, get better with those seller um, phone conversations on the front end, the seller negotiations at the living room. And then, you know, things like you mentioned earlier, actually having access to a buyer's list or figuring out if you can close out the deal and turn it around. Um, one of the best bets that, you know, that worked for me early on was to align myself with somebody who was already doing volume in the, in the market and, you, you know, to identify someone like that to be like, quote unquote, a mentor. Um, there's a lot of paid mentors and people who do coaching that are great and top notch and know what they're talking about. If you can find the right one, uh, just make sure that they have the results. But if, if you are doing wholesaling in a market, Usually wholesaling is going to work bigger in my experience in markets that are like four, five, six million people. 
um, as opposed to, you know, half a million people in the entire metro or maybe like a million. Those are going to be harder markets to survive in as a wholesaler. So if you're in a larger city and you identify somebody who's doing volume, and somebody who also kind of has the door open to have like referral deals brought to the table. Um, for me, it worked well to become good at lead generation, but then find the guy in the Philadelphia market who was already doing volume, had a huge buyers list, had contacts, had cash to close on the deals if I needed to. And it cost me, Jim, half of a lot of deals. I mean, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars in those first couple of years that I, you know, shared with those partners, but that ultimately like, that ultimately led to me developing the skill set myself to grow, um, you know, to the next level. One, one thing too, I guess, as I say that is like, you know, never be afraid as a, as a new investor to like give up a chunk of the deal. So like early on in 2006, seven and eight, some of my biggest or one of my biggest mistakes was, you know, we would do a deal, two deals, three deals, make $40,000. My mind would be blown and the greed in my mind would like cloud my judgment and I would get to having thoughts like, yeah, I could do this whole deal myself. Like, I don't need any partners. What did this guy bring to the table? He just brought a buyer. And so I've seen that happen not only in my own mindset, but I've observed that happen in the mindset of like people who have been partners and then split, you know, from me over the years, people who have brought deals to the table, people who have greedily held on to the deals that could have been closed um, and end up not closing because they're not willing to like, participate in those those joint ventures so like your ability to partner with you know one or multiple people and identify those right people is like really critical at least in my opinion in my experience to get into a place where you're doing a you know high volume of you know and i think deal participation and jay being it was a great point to make i think it is critical i'd rather have half of uh, many deals than you know all of just a couple deals <laughs> myself yeah. but i'm not greedy and there there's enough money in all of this that, that everybody can do really well so i think that that's a great way to grow as well um what do you like your direct mail list to look like you mentioned absentee owners what other criteria are you looking at you mentioned equity so like in list source you can pick out a percentage of equity i don't know how you're pulling your list um, if it's a uh, yeah if it's a hot neighborhood where you have gentrification going on. So in South Philadelphia, we have areas where um, property values are increasing so fast. I mean, we literally had, um, we had a deal under contract at one point and there was title issues and the contract price was 20,000 or 18,000, somewhere around there low. And we had it sold to somebody and we were getting offers around 30, 35 and we would have happily settled that thing out. Um, it took three or four months to, clear up the title issues. By the time the title issues were clear, I think we ended up getting $55,000. So the market was moving so fast in that neighborhood where um, the equity percentage loan to value on a list pool could be higher. So like in my average city in America, I'm at 50% loan to value or less. So I, I, I want 50% equity in the property uh, in order for, for me to like mail that. I also want them to own the property. Give give or take five to 10 years. Usually I'm making those adjustments based on what my budget is. So if I'm trying to fit into an 8,000, you know, record mail budget, uh, I'm going to, you know, adjust the length of ownership to adjust, you know, rather than adjust the equity position. Mm -hmm. um, in those hot neighborhoods like South Philadelphia, I might go up to 65 or even 75% ARV because there's even properties that like in a neighborhood like that, I'll pay a full retail value and hold the properties, you know, because I know the growth is coming. And if it's, you know, halfway decent condition, like I, I don't care, I'll pay 75 knowing that a year, two years, three years down the line, it's worth 120, 150, 200,000 uh, or more. So that's why I'll go with the higher loan to value. But you have the absentee owner list. I'll even pull just a high equity list. Like not a lot of people are gonna mail just a straight high equity list. Um, so there's really, there's no pools at all in that. Um, high equity list other than the fact that they have high equity and I'm choosing by zip codes or usually by county where we're located. Um, probate lists are, you know, obviously good um, lead sources. We do a few deals out of there. I thought that was a silver bullet when I first started it, but you know, that's actually a relatively small portion of my I think um, on probate. It's like um, you, you don't get something right away, but you get some really deep deals. They just can take a while to come in. You sort of find the same. 
Yeah, they do take a while to come in. I guess sometimes people are kind of getting stuff together. Like we do a periodic steady number of deals from probate, but I found in most of the cities I'm in, it's really heavy competition on a probate list. Whereas like, you know, if, I, if you can afford to do a very large mailing to it, like an entire county of high equity, you're going to land in a lot of mailboxes where no one's receiving any letters. But when, you know, a probate lead calls me, um, they have like a stack of cards this big. All of them say the same thing because they're going to yellowletters.com. They just have a different name in there. Um, so another tip there is write your own letter, be personable, and talk about, you know, something different than the yellow letters. Even though it's easy and you push a button, it's just, you know, big stacks to mail that you're competing So with. did you say yellowlettersComplete.com or which one did you mention? I have no clue. I never used any of them. I just know that these are all form <laughs> letters and there's yeah. big stacks. So do you do have. postcards or do you like letters? When I like both. Yeah, I like both. I like the generic postcard, you know, on the heels of a letter, like send a letter a month or two later, send a postcard, to something totally, you know, different and simple and almost looking like the form letters. That, that I think that I like a four, five, six touch where you're mixing up colors and mixing up media, I think is, is a good formula, at least for me. Yeah, absolutely. I think it works out pretty well. Besides uh, direct mail, what, what types of marketing do you like to do? Um, that's my favorite. I like, obviously I keep a lot of, uh, wholesalers. I stay on a lot of wholesalers lists in every city. So I'm constantly checking those on a daily basis. Uh, once in a while I'm buying, you know, probably once a month, at least I'm buying properties from wholesalers. People come through my podcast site and sell me deals in those markets that I'm in once they've been around for a while. Uh, some of those people have literally like read my book and learned how to wholesale. And that's pretty cool. They like read the book and then I'm sending them a check and I'm buying the deal from them. Um, so that, that, that's always good. I do pay-per-click advertising, but these days the pay-per-click, um, again, it's a competition thing, Jim. It's, you know, it's the probate lead. They're going down the list of people on Google and they're getting five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people out there. And, you know, half the time it's one or two wholesalers that don't understand the business like me in the beginning who are overpaying and kind of torpedo on my deal, even though it's going to close you know, at my price with the right buyer, uh, a lot of times there's a, there's a front end loading of wasted time. Uh, you know, a minute ago, you, I think, gave away a pretty good tip, which is some people might not understand why a volume wholesaler would want to join everybody else's wholesaling list. You want to uh, touch on that a little bit? I'm on as many wholesaling lists as I can as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm not just a volume wholesaler. So I have like, you know, tons of cash lined up from private investors all over the country. Um, so we're ready to pull the trigger, close on and renovate, you know, anything that we put our name on a contract. So when I'm buying from wholesalers, I'm not daisy chaining and wholesaling the deal out. It's got to be what I'm looking for. And what I'm really looking for now these days, because the market's hot, it's May, it's June 7, 2018. The market's hot enough where there's a lot of neighborhoods where we can get a property. It's a good school district. It's not a rental neighborhood. I love to close on it, you know, paint the property out, carpet it, uh, you know, do a clean out and, and resell it with, you know, 20, 30, $40,000 max, maybe do a new kitchen and bathroom in there. Um, so like I'm looking for like a minimum cosmetic rehab situation that I could turn around and resell. And sometimes the wholesalers are, are bringing exactly that. And their numbers are like slightly high to do like the full gut renovation that a lot of investors are doing. So like I'm able to pay a little more in many cases than every other investor in the market because my strategy is slightly different. I'm, you know, I guess, you, could, you know, I'm doing a, a, a medium run of the road, kind of a cleanup more so than a rehab on some of those properties and reselling them. So those, those would be ideal for me. The uh, Chicago market here has properties that you could buy for three, four, five hundred thousand dollars and you could put three, four, or five hundred thousand dollars in renovations, gut, you know, gut renovate, twenty five hundred square foot, graystone two flat deconversion, and sell them for like one point two, one point three million dollars. And people are doing that level of rehab. I don't want to spend a year and go through all the architectural plans, drawings, mm -hmm. permits, take that kind of risk to resell it. So that's, we're not like a, uh, you know, rehab specialist with uh, the crews that are going to do these like almost near new construction builds. We prefer to do the cosmetic. 50, I love cosmetic work. flips too. And it goes back into a discussion of wholetailing a little bit as well, but I, th I like it because of the speed factor. I think it limits my risk and allows me to hit more volume doing so. 
Um, so we can Absolutely. crank them out almost like a production builder, but more like a production rehabber, I guess. Absolutely. So I agree with you. The more you can do that's just simple little cosmetic flips, you may come in, do a kitchen, um, flooring paint, maybe a roof, some windows, heat pump or heating and air and get out. In and out quick is, is my model. I don't want to get bogged down with architectural reviews, permits, plans, um, and stuff that I can't really control on my timeline. I really like speed when I'm rehabbing. And it sounds like you do as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, how would uh, some of our listeners that are taking this idea of joining other people's wholesaling, wholesale buyers list, how would you recommend they find other wholesalers in their market? Um, I mean, I guess if you're sending out emails, you'd want to make sure to pay attention when you get an email or somebody forwards something to you, uh, just to communicate back with them. So I'm constantly getting people, Hey, I want to be added to your email list. I have no clue who forwarded them the email, um, et cetera. One thing would be to develop like a, a decent property site. So if you're a wholesaler and you're selling properties, uh, make sure you have a form on your website for other people to um, sign up for your buyers list and then have your first autoresponder email say something to the effect that you also buy properties, close right. cash. And if you are in you know, possession of those type of deals, please add me to your buyers list if you had one. Um, <laughs> other than that, I guess, you know, you're looking at Craigslist ads and you're seeing people who have inventory on there. You know, the person who's got three, four or five deals on there may have um, potentially a lot of people you know, are posting them right on to Facebook nowadays. So it's easy to find them and you could always go to your investor club as well, I suppose, um, and go that route. But I think you're right. And, and as far as like that simple little forum, I've had Trevor mock on from on carrot and he's got a really simple solution for people if, if they want to check it out for building that list and, and building it up bigger, um, I think is a great way to go. Okay. I think if it's a wholesale, though, Jim, to be honest, I think trying to get on other people's lists and putting effort and time into that is is pretty much, it's, it's a little bit of a waste of time. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't suggest making that my focus. Like if I was going to go to the, you know, real estate investors networking event right. in the area, I would focus on trying to collect buyers information rather, you know, there's such a limited amount of time that I think focusing on people who actually have the money and having the conversations and lunches with them would be more important for uh, a wholesaler new and early in the game than trying to network with all So the in these five cities you're in Chicago, Atlanta, Miami, Philadelphia, um, Tampa, did you did you strategically try to identify the top buyers in those markets and then capture them as clients as well? Um not necessarily. Okay. We put some of our stuff on the MLS. Like I said, we're prepared with, you know, well capitalized companies so we're ready to close on anything that we buy. Um, and because of that, we'll throw it on the MLS and a lot of times just close it out in the period of time while we're waiting for the resale to happen. So we right. do some assignment deals, but most of our deals are we're closing with our cash. Like and then turning close, it kind of. Okay. All right. That sounds good. So we talked a lot about building your deal flow. And that's where a lot of people are struggling nowadays. We've talked some about um, building your buyer's list and communicating your 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 um, to your buyer community um, quite a bit there. Let's talk just a little bit in our final segment here about systems. And by the way, I want to congratulate you on REI Diamonds. It's an awesome podcast. And, uh, you know, before we go to that last segment on processes and systems, tell us a little bit about the podcast and, and the why behind you starting to do it as well. Well, the real reason, Jim, that I do the podcast is as I kind of a value add to my network, we have large buyers lists. In each city, we're probably between 10 and 20,000 buyers on each one of our buyers lists on the email. So we want to try to stay relevant to them. And, on, and early on in each of those markets, I really didn't have a lot to promote as I was like paying for and building those buyers lists. So that was like one way to build the buyers list and provide value to the buyers list is through publishing the podcast um, in each of those cities. And I do that as a bit of a tool sharpening, mind sharpening, kind of like my mentor um, of my own mindset. And it's a recorded conversation and shared with everybody. And it's really just about trying to dig down to some of the real like meat and potatoes, the methods, the details, 
uh, the precision that other successful investors, real estate developers, um, et cetera, sometimes, you know, lenders and, and loan officers and whoever's got information that we think is important will come on the show. Um, and we record that and there's no sales pitch or anything. And we're just trying to basically, you know, have best practices shared with people in the network. So it's kind of a passion project in that sense, but it does help um, people find us. We've been introduced to, you know, hundreds of private lenders through that podcast and, you know, thousands of buyers have found us through that podcast as well. Okay. That's awesome. Okay, so that's REI Diamonds podcast. Now, you got that awesome board right behind you. If people are watching on YouTube, they can see it. If you're listening on iTunes, um, you'll want to check it out on YouTube. Tell us, like, how do you organize your deal flow and keep track? What do you have behind you there? I think we have somewhere around 80 or 90 contracts right now in some stage of either property under contract waiting for title potentially being sold, uh, waiting for title, potentially being rehab, properties we own that are being rehab, or properties that are sold and waiting to go to settlement. So on the board behind me, you can see mostly the Chicago region board, and we have the, uh, we have the Philadelphia board on this side. So these mm -hmm. are properties that are under contract, and we're deciding whether or not we're going to resell them, renovate them, uh, or assign them out. In the middle, we have uh, all my REO inventory that we actually own already right now being renovated or just sold. And then we have the pending inventory kind of hanging down in this, this column here. So each of these four boards has three columns. Uh, Chicago is the, the, the biggest volume market that we have. It's the largest population wise. It's where I live. We have a, a lot of teams here. We've been here a while. Um, Philadelphia, you know, you can see there's a, a lot of stuff on the board. You can't really see we do have a, a lot of deals cooking in both of the other three markets as well. Okay, so that's how you keep track of it. And the three columns are the last one to the right was basically your cash flow coming in. Your middle one was um, pending, and your last yeah, one is stuff in the middle there. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. I love it. What does your team look like? Last question. I have a vice president in charge of each market, and we have acquisition managers who are working sort of with them. Um, so you know, there's. There's no real like employees. Everyone's kind of like coming together and partnering in a sense on each individual specific deal. So, um, you know, whoever's in the Atlanta market's not necessarily in the Chicago market and vice versa. Um, so that's kind of my mentality is more to develop business partners and try to coach the team and find better systems and ways of operating with my team so that we're all sharing like equally in a sense on the deals as opposed to hiring salespeople and uh, treating each of the you know people like employees who are replaceable and interchangeable. And I'm looking to just build like longer term, um, you know, long term partnership situations with the people that are my team. How do you find a good acquisitions manager? I know wholesalers right now that are struggling with that. I have developed many of them um, from the ground up and they have come through my podcast. We have our networking events here in Chicago, uh, on a quarterly basis. So I make sure that I put myself out there in the public where people can find me, approach me, watch me from the back of the room, get to know me, decide if I'm an asshole or from somebody they want to do business with. Um, and they, you know, they have come through the podcast and the people who like, I'm sure you find on yours, Jim, the people who listen to the podcast and we're regular, you know, audience members and they get to know you before they come to the tables. So those acquisition managers, you know, kind of like were attracted by our values and the way that we did things. And, you know, they read my book on wholesaling um, and they already had a good basic background knowledge of the business and the game, although they had not found anywhere they could succeed and get the traction. Just like you mentioned at the beginning of our episode here, Jim, a lot of people treat it as a hobby. There's little fits and starts, and it's really it's hard. There's not a lot of people who are out in the real estate investment world who figure out how to turn it into a business and, and get to the next level. And so, like, our acquisition managers, you know, heard about us and made it their mission to seek out and find us. Um, you know, even a guy in Atlanta, like, he came in through the Chicago Real Estate Investor Networking Group that we run. Mm -hmm. um, and those, those have been by far, hands down, the people who have come through the doors of the networking event and through the podcast, hands down the best acquisition. Manager. Networking is everything to me. It sounds so simple, but it's really true. 
Okay, well, that is awesome. I want to respect your time. You got a big business to run and a lot of deal flow with two to 300 deals in five cities. But I really appreciate digging into your um, direct mail marketing in particular and, uh, and being so candid about that. I really appreciate it. Um, again, uh, everyone should go check out REI Diamonds, the podcast with Dan Breslin, and uh, subscribe. Leave them, leave them a nice review in iTunes, please. You're going to love it. You're going to get a lot of value out of it and go there and check that out. Dan, I want to thank you for being with us on Real Estate Success today and wish you all the luck on your deal flow throughout the year. Absolutely. And one last thing, Jim, for your listeners, if they want to get a copy of the book that I did write on yep. wholesaling, uh, you know, that's available PDF for free. You can check that out at the website, reidiamonds.com. Uh, pop your email in, you'll have instant access to basically my business plan that I followed since 2012 to get to where we're at today. Awesome. So Jim, I really, I really appreciate you being here. And most of all, I appreciate uh, all the audience members for checking us out today. Yeah, I do too. Our, our success listeners are awesome. And uh, go to reidiamonds.com, grab that free PDF, and I'll link that in the show notes on my website at Investing Now Network as well. All right, Dan, thanks and best of luck uh, with all your deals.